Lord, we ask that we get fed by the word that you have given, that you will give us, Father God. And Lord, bless Pastor Darby, bless his tongue, so that he may speak your word with confidence, and may he speak it well, Father. Lord, we ask for traveling mercies after the service is done. Lord, we pray for those who don't, who didn't make it. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, who are mentally ill, and Lord, those who are hurting in general, Father. So, Lord, as I end this prayer, we ask that we get fed in your word, Father. And we ask this all in the, in, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, CJ. God bless everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Spending time in worship. Praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Be joyous. This is where we get our strength. When we get through our week, this is where we get fed. This is how we can um, get through our week. For those who don't know, I've always said, and I joke around, but it's really serious as well, is that us Christians love to eat. Yes. You know, you put a plate of food out, we'll be, we'll be there, you know? That's the way we should be with God's word. We should be ready with our fork and knife and be ready like, yo, I'm ready to chew this up. I'm ready to just take this in. And this is gonna be the energy. This is gonna be the carbs. This is gonna be the protein that's gonna get me through my week. So we should be excited to be in God's word. We should be ready to consume it, analyze it, and apply it in our lives. So in today's message, which is an interesting message for today as the Lord has given to me, is talking about seizing the opportunity. So for example, as soon as we came to Christ, we came soldiers for Christ. We have to be the kind of people that we seize the opportunity to minister to someone. And there's always an opportunity to seize. So for those who don't know, we went marching for Jesus in the Bronx yesterday. And there was a good turnout. It was a decent turnout. And there was a good amount of people that came and accepted Christ. Now, what's needed is that some people need to step up. If you've been eating, you need to step up now and feed others, serve others. That means we're called to disciple the next person that's next to us. So those people that just came and confessed to Christ, someone needs to step up and disciple them and teach them how to read the word of God. Be that person, that ear, that when that person says, I have a question, do you have time? Don't be that person that says, I'm gonna rush, can I talk to you later? Don't be that person. There's things that could be put on hold in order to help someone's soul. We need to seize the opportunity. We know we all live in New York. New York is one of the busiest places in the world. If you can survive here, you can survive anywhere. But here's the thing, we're always in a rush. You know, there's been stories that you've seen in the news and read in the paper, and I've been here my whole life, but I've also lived outside of New York. But you see how when there's seriously people in trouble, how many New Yorkers actually stand up and take up their time to help someone. One of those times was 9-11. You know, New Yorkers can seem selfish at times, you know? Don't mess with me, I gotta get to work. But when it came to 9-11, so many people gave up their time, sacrificed their paycheck, and said, no, I'm gonna go down to Wall Street and help dig people out, you know? We need to learn to sacrifice of our time for souls. We need to be pro proactive, not reactive. Because you know what? Once someone is passed on, now they come into judgment. We have to get them before they come into judgment, okay? So we have to get to them and provide the story, the, the key to salvation, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, okay? So the, the text today is going to be found in Luke chapter 10. We're going to be verses 29 through 37. I'm going to be reading it in the NIV, but we're going to be examining how to embrace opportunities to make a difference. Because once we serve the Lord, we should be making a difference in our community. First, at home because we're the light at home. The word of God says, whoever confesses my name, him and his family are saved. How does that look like? That looks like first that that person who come profess Jesus got to live like Jesus so everyone else around them starts serving Jesus. So we got to serve like Jesus in order to get everyone else to be like Jesus. So one of the things we see Jesus always did is that he never missed an opportunity to serve. You know, he loved to serve. Even when people were trying to wipe his feet and everything, he was like, no, 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 I got this. So we have to understand that sometimes as human beings, we love to be served. Let somebody bring a plate of food to you. You're not going to turn it away. You're going to be like, thank you. You thought of me. You know? 
They bring you a, 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 a hokum dandules and some, some chuleta. You be like, yeah, I'll have that. You know, you're not going to turn it away. But how many of you look around and be like, hold on, let me make sure everyone else has a plate before I eat. We have to be that person. Let me make sure someone is fed before I feed myself. Okay? So we're going to examine some tough calls, some missed calls and opportunities in life. When we were younger, which is interesting because some of us had that conversation, when you think of careers, sometimes you miss that call. You know, you're waiting for that call from that job that says you got the job and you miss it. And you know, I'm gonna age myself. There was times back in the days, you know, you only get three calls from that company. If you don't pick up any of those three calls, they're like, okay, we'll go to the next person. You don't really want the job. We'll get to the next person. So I remember years ago when I applied for my dream job for the government, I had missed the calls. I was on a cruise somewhere with my wife. I didn't think they were gonna call me because they had called me before and then they put a job hold. So I didn't think they were gonna call me. I said, okay, I, I was already on hold for 10 years. I said, well, who knows when they're gonna call me. Next thing you know, I come back and I hear they're looking for me. And I'm like, first of all, I didn't know if they were looking for me for another reason. And my wife started laughing. She's, she's, the first thing she said is, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. I was with you the whole cruise, so I don't know why they're looking for me. Next thing you know, I go to my own neighborhood. They said, they're looking for you. Don't come to the neighborhood. I'm like, I don't know why they're looking for me, but we'll see what happens. I get back home, and there's an FBI agent waiting at my door. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying to go through my mind. Did I do anything? I don't recall doing anything, but let's see what he wants. He goes, are you Darby Paris? I said, yes. He goes, we've been looking for you for a while. I said, oh, I was on a cruise. So that's why I didn't have my phone or anything. He goes, I'm just going to ask you one thing. Do you want the job or not? And I, I forgot so long. I said, which job is that? And he goes, do you want to be a customs agent or not? I said, well, of course I do. Yes. He goes, I don't have to ask you anything else. I just wanted to see if you still wanted the job. It's yours if you want it. So there are missed opportunities when we miss the call. In Jesus, we cannot miss opportunities, okay? So we can't be the kind of people that be like, woulda, coulda, shoulda, and have regrets. You ever have that one time you wish you could have ministered to someone and you said, man, I, I, I was too scared, I didn't know what to say, and therefore you missed that opportunity and then you're wondering, what could I have done? What if this person now is wandering the world and that was the only opportunity for them to come to the Lord? First of all, remember, you're not the only opportunity. You missed out on the blessing. But that person, someone else, the Lord is going to raise up to minister to them. But you should have been the first one when the Lord lifted you up to go minister to that person. We shouldn't be so timid, afraid of ministering to someone. Some of us think we don't have enough words to say. Don't count your words. Trust in the Holy Spirit that's going to give you the words. I love this young man right here. Not hesitant. People came up to him and he ministered to them. With the knowledge he has, because you don't have to know a whole lot. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be a master theologian, have a master's degree in theology. You have to love the Lord. And then you can communicate that love to someone else. So that's what he did. And praise the Lord, I laughed because I was with his mom. And his mom kept looking at me be like, remember when he didn't talk? You know? Now you can't shut him up, and now he's, shut, he's speaking for the Lord, you know? So that's a blessing. He's honoring the Lord. And that's the perspective we need to have. That's kingdom vision, that we do it for the kingdom. We don't do it for our glory. And don't think I'm lifting him up. I'm lifting up Jesus that worked in him. And we praise the Lord for allowing him to be used by the Lord, okay? So let's go to the um, verse. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, and I'm going to read it in the NIV. And we're going to, we're going to chew the, the meat of, of this, uh, these verses. So I'm going to break it down for you guys. So this is the parable of the Good Samaritan, okay? So we see in verse 25, and let me know if you guys are all with me. Everybody's with me saying amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right. It says on verse 25, on one occasion... An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? I'm going to pause there for a minute. We're going to start breaking this down, all right? So here's someone who most likely was a Pharisee who recognized Jesus as a great teacher, but didn't recognize him as Messiah. And what's the question he says? 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? See, as human beings, we tend to think we can save ourselves. We cannot. As soon as he started with that question, he was still in the Pharisees' mindset instead of kingdom mindset. He was saying, I want to try to test him and see what he says, what he's selling. Not understanding that Jesus is not selling anything. He's here to save. Okay? So we see in verse 26, Jesus responds to him, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Meaning, how do you interpret it? Okay? And in verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So this is dying to self. You're giving yourself completely to the Lord. And now, since you've given yourself to the Lord completely, now you've got to love your neighbor. That neighbor who lives next to you that is rowdy, that neighbor that's smoking marijuana all the time, that's getting into your apartment, you got to love that person now. Most times you want to be calling the cops on the person. Now you have to love them. That means you have to interact with that person. You have to minister to that person. All right? So he says in verse 28, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now here comes the but. We always have that, that person who always puts his butt in the way. You know, be like, but. What does this mean? Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? So he was making it racial. Now it's about race. He's making it racial. Who is my neighbor? I want distinction lines. Who is going to be my neighbor that I have to treat? He wanted to be division. Here comes Jesus' reply. And Jesus' reply said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. So he comes in with a parable. Okay? They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, a Levite, for those who don't know, is a worshiper, okay, and from the tribe of Levites. When he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So this person, a Levite, a person called by the Lord to set the atmosphere, to worship the Lord, crossed the street, literally, to avoid this person who needed help. So we see in verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii. This is salary for two months. And gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Verse 36, here comes Jesus. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, what Jesus is clarifying is there's no distinction. Everyone needs him, and everyone needs to be ministered to. Everyone needs to be served. Here you see two religious people. And the, the, the Pharisees, can't, the, the, the high priest cannot make any excuse saying that he was going to the temple, that he didn't want to get um, dirty. He's, he's coming back from the temple, so he's not going to be at risk of dirtying himself. Understand? So he could have helped. He just didn't want to help. So if we go back to those verses, it says, a man was going down to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. How many people have you passed on the other side that you could have ministered to? How many people you ignored? How many people that maybe the Lord put on your path to minister and may have asked you a question that was a way for you to have an opening to minister to someone? And we ignore the person because maybe they're homeless, maybe they're dirty, maybe they're drug addict. And because you don't want to dirty yourself, you're like, I'm not going to get near that person. Or even worse, sometimes we think people have an ulterior motive. And they may. So what we are called to do is be cautious. We look for discernment from the Holy Spirit before we act. Remember, when we came to Christ, we don't own ourselves anymore. So every action we take, we should be seeking discernment from the Holy Spirit. We don't own ourselves. God owns us. 
So before I make any decisions, I should be saying, Lord, is this something I should do? And the Lord will respond. Mm -hmm. And if the Lord didn't respond, don't be taking no action because he didn't respond. That means wait. How many of you have seen those crossing lights that are for deaf people, I mean blind people? Mm -hmm. And when you press the button to cross the street, it tells you, wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife always laugh about that because we, we can picture the Holy Spirit saying, wait, I didn't tell you to cross the street. What are you doing? I didn't tell you to do that yet. Wait. We are the hardest people to tell the wait to, especially New Yorkers. We don't like to wait. You tell us the train is five minutes late, we start cursing people out. No, we need to know that there's a reason for the wait, okay? So, one thing we can learn from this is that there's always an opportunity to help someone in need. Here we see the Samaritan, which is the word where we get from the Good Samaritan, someone who helps someone, and we see that a lot in the news when someone was a good Samaritan to help someone. A perfect example of that is the actor Denzel Washington. He never really put out there that he's a Christian, but his actions speak that he's a Christian. There was one time there was a car accident, car on fire, and he literally took the person out of the car at risk of burning himself. Wow. He didn't wait there for people to take pictures and be like, oh look, he's famous, he did this. He got in his car and left because he knew they were gonna try to do that. He didn't do it for the glory, he did it for the kingdom. And when people ask him about that, he testifies that. He says, I didn't do it for me, I did it. A person was in need, there was a risk, I took it and I helped this person. This is what we're called to do. We need to understand that sometimes we're so afraid of for ourselves, we're not taking the risk and we're missing out on the blessings. If we're children of the kingdom, don't be afraid. Trust in the Lord. Do his will. You know, there's a lot of people that like to be served. They're sitting in church, they're eating, but they're not serving. They're the first ones quick that if they're saying, okay, we need someone to serve, and they're sitting down waiting for someone else to stand up. No, that shouldn't be the case. We should be the kind of person, as they say in Spanish, deponible, willing. We need to always be willing to use our skill set for the glory of the kingdom. The first time I started working with Pastor Sam, the first thing I told him was, I'm here to rest, but I gave him my resume, which was a wrong mistake I did with him. Yeah. Gave him my resume and say, okay, this is where all my skill sets are at, you need me there. And as soon as I said that, he goes, well, I need you here, I need you here, I need you here. And the first, as soon as he said that, I said, I am not gonna rest here. <laughs> this is not my place to rest, but our rest is in Jesus. That's our Sabbath, is in Jesus. So I did rest because I healed in Circle of Christ Church. I rested while serving. You can do both. You can rest while serving. You know, some people think rest is being at a beach and getting some sunlight. You know the sun comes from the Lord. So wherever you're at, his light is shining on you. So we need to quit with the nonsense like, I need to sit down. There's people who are perfectly healthy sitting down and there's people who are not so healthy physically, but healthier spiritually and they're doing all the serving. There's a problem with that. That shouldn't be, okay? All right, so one thing we're gonna look at as an illustration. Um, we had this person who was walking up and he saw a sign and the sign said, there's no limit to the good a man can do if he doesn't care who gets the credit. This is the mindset we need to have. We can do so much good if we didn't care who gets the credit. You know, there are so many churches that are in competition when there's no competition to be had. We're here to glorify the Lord together. We just had that conversation before we started service. There's a church down the hall glorifying the Lord. Praise Jesus. Whoever we can reach, let them reach, and vice versa. There is no competition as long as they're in the Word of God. Because that's the key. you got to be in the Word of God. If you're not in the Word of God, you got to call them out. We have to hold people accountable. If you call yourself a child of Christ, we got to hold them accountable. We have to. All right. So if you really don't care who gets the credit, you get to enjoy yourself in the service because you're doing it for the glory of the kingdom. We can do so many good deeds for others. We just have to be active in the kingdom. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, what is considered the most well-known new parable, we see it could be interpreted in two levels. 
The first level is a plain teaching that a person like the Samaritan should help others in need. The second is the context of the rejection of Jesus. Remember, this is a Pharisee that's asking Jesus a question, and it's a test question. He's trying to test Jesus. We sometimes do that. We test Jesus. We're like, okay, Lord, I may serve you if you can do this for me. We treat Jesus like a genie in a bottle and be like, Jesus, if you do this for me, then I know that you're true and I'll come serve you. But you want to serve Jesus your way. So you, you're not even explaining that, but the Lord knows that. You want to serve him your way. And this is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. You serve him the way he requires you to serve him. Okay? So we see in the context that here's the Pharisee rejecting Jesus, knowing who he is. He just doesn't want to accept him as the Messiah. That's why he's testing them. This is all in prophetic prophecy. He's trying to set them up for the cross. That's what we see here. But Jesus is aware of this. So we see here that the Jewish religious leaders rejected the very man who fell among the robbers. Here are the leaders of the faith, and they're turning a blind eye to the person in need. How many of us do that? How many of us profess Jesus? We wear a cross around our neck and all kinds of things. We wear Jesus on our sleeve, yet we're not living Jesus. We have to be careful with that. Because when someone says, oh, can you pray for me? Are you ready to pray for someone? Sometimes someone may come to you and you think they want money and all they want is prayer. How many of you are ready to pray for someone, lay hands? How many of you are prayed up and ready to lay hands? Because remember, you can't lay hands on just anyone. If you're not prayed up, Whatever's going on in that person can easily affect you in a negative way. So you need to be prayed up. You can't just lay hands on anyone. Before we did the march, you have to be prayed up. This has to be lifted up and prayed where beforehand, okay? So we see the Samaritans, as a race, were scorned by the Jewish people because they were a mix of Jewish and Gentile ancestry. So for example, we're Gentiles. To the Orthodox Jew, we're Gentiles. They won't mix with you. If you ever try to shake the hand of an Orthodox Jew, they'll look at you like you're crazy. Because then they will be dirty if they shook your hand. They won't even look at you in the face at times. Okay? So this is what um, Jesus was trying to communicate to them, that they are so selfish. They're not looking at the need of society. They're being divisionally religious. They're dividing. Okay? They're being divisive. So are we being divisive in the neighborhood we live in? One thing I told you guys in the very beginning, there's no such thing as a Spanish church or black church. That's a man-made term. Just because the majority is black people doesn't make it a black church. It's the church of Christ because it belongs to Christ. If it's majority Spanish people, it's the church of Christ. It's not a Spanish church. There's Spanish people in it, but it's the church of Christ. That's what we have to keep in mind. We gotta stop causing division. We gotta remember the neighborhoods we're at. If you look at the neighborhood of Co-op City, this used to be majority Russian Orthodox Jews. Mm -hmm. Now you see very minimal remnants of the Jewish Russian Jews. What you see now more is Latinos, you see more African Americans, Afro Latinos. What you're realizing if you really live in the neighborhood and you're paying attention is, you're seeing Chinese people coming into the neighborhood. There's more Asians coming into the neighborhood. And you're gonna see more Asians of the faith. Because what you don't understand is that there's a lot of work being done for the kingdom in China. So for example, we met a family like that in Circle of Christ. And they came seeking the Lord. Because they used to go to a house church in China. So their idea is to always be in the house of the Lord. And you know, here we got freedoms compared to China. China, you could go to jail for going to a house church. And it's not just a jail for like one year, six months. We're talking about 10 years of suffering, of sleeping on a cement floor, fighting for your food with rats that are bigger than cats. This is what goes on in China on a daily basis. Let it be a couple, what they do is that they put the man to see his wife be raped on a constant basis. This is what they go through in order to deter them from their faith. And you have people here that are going through that and they refuse to turn away from Jesus. They just keep praying to Jesus. There's one man 
who was serving the Lord and he used to do whole services over there. He kept falling into jail. They would let him out, he would go back in. So what they did was that they took his Bible and they used it as tissue paper for when they went to the bathroom. And then they would throw it into his cell. So what the man did was he would shake it off and get as much grime off it. And then he had his Bible back. And in his mindset was like, joke's on you. Now you gave me my Bible back. So I could keep praying to the Lord and reading his word and being more intimate with the Lord. This is kingdom perspective. For us, we're soft. Let's be real. Us people here in the United States are soft. Let them do that to us. We'll be like, I'm not touching that. We'll be like, I'm not reading that. We're way too soft compared to Christians who are being persecuted outside of the United States. Okay? So, we can't miss opportunities to minister, but we do have to recognize the cost of sacrifice. What is the cost of being a disciple for Christ? That's something Jesus always asked when people said they wanted to follow him. What is the cost to follow him? Some people didn't understand the value, what they were going to go through. For example, Peter. Peter kept saying, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, you will deny me. You will deny me three times before the crow. And what happened? He did exactly that. To the point that when he was on the walk with the cross, a little girl went up to Peter and said, you look like him, you smell like him, you even walk like him. And he literally almost cursed out that little girl. This is what we see. We're too soft in the Lord. We need to toughen up in the Lord. We're soldiers for Christ. We need to be walking for Christ. We need to be holding the line for Christ. Okay? So the next verses we're going to be going to is Matthew chapter 19, verses 20 through 22. The cost of discipleship. Matthew 19, verses 20 through 22. And this is to remind us we can't miss those calls, those opportunities. We can't be afraid to make the sacrifice, okay? So when we answer the call, we must understand that we have to die to our desires, all right? So we see in Matthew 19, we're gonna start from verse 16, 16 all the way to 22. And then we're gonna read in the New International Version. And let me know when you guys all have a say in amen. 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 amen, amen. So we're ready to eat, right? We got those forks out? All right, all right. This is better than filet mignon. We got some meat here, we got some protein. So verse 16 says, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Notice the, the key word there, what must I do to get eternal life? Verse 17, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. And just in case you guys didn't know, gossip is false testimony, okay? Don't get it twisted. Uh -huh. Gossip is included there. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20, all these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So as we look at these verses, let's look at what's going on here. First off, he wanted to get saved without paying a price. And he wanted to do it by himself. So when he inquired, what good thing must I do? We have to understand, we can't save ourselves. Jesus saves us. We have to understand, he paid a price for us. Once we understand that, that's when we have a true encounter with the Lord, and that's when we give ourselves to the Lord. When we understand there's no way we could pay that debt back. So imagine, every time, you, when you're walking in Christ, every time someone sees you, they don't see you, or they should not see you, they should see Christ. Why? Because he paid the debt that you could not pay. So when God the Father sees you, he sees Jesus in you. Remember, Jesus imputed in you. That's why you, the Lord can deal with us. 
Because the blood of Jesus covers us, so it makes us clean. Now, can we sometimes dirty ourselves? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But the good thing is, now we have an intercessor in Jesus Christ, our lawyer, who we plead to and say, Lord, forgive me. And when God the Father sees us making mistakes, Jesus says, give him another chance. I've been in their shoes. Give him another opportunity. This is why I paid that price, to give him that opportunity. All right? So we see in verse 17, here's him trying to say, ask, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus says, there's only one who's good. How many of you ever met someone who says, but I'm a good person. Why wouldn't, why can't I just be me? No, there's no such thing as a good person. And you see that more so in the United States. A lot of people think they have done no bad. If you lie to someone, You've done bad. You've sinned. If you ever taken something that's not yours, whether it be someone's spouse, someone's girlfriend, someone's boyfriend, you've committed a sin. You've stolen. If you ever thought, oh, nobody's missing this, and you see something that doesn't belong to you, you just took something that was not yours. So we, we tend to like give ourselves excuses when we do things that are not correct. Okay? So we see in verse 17, he says, there's only one who's good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. See, what Jesus was teaching, because Jesus is a great teacher. He was always teaching. There was no moment he wasn't teaching. And this is why we have to look at an opportunity to minister. There's always an opportunity to minister. What Jesus was communicating is, the law doesn't save you. The law from the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, does not save people. All it does reveal is that you are a sinner. You failed. That's all it is. Picture taking a test that you know you already failed and you looked at the answer key. All it does reveal is that you messed up. That's it. But we don't go into the fact of understanding that this is how we get saved. We get saved because we are messed up and it's through him that we get saved. So we gotta look at that blessing. What are we doing with that blessing? So he's reminding him, the law does not save, okay? Keeping the commandments doesn't save. All it does is reveal the moral will of God. For example, our laws today here in the United States are the moral will of God revealed. If you commit murder, you're going to go to jail. If you commit adultery, well, in certain states, you're going to go to jail. If you commit certain acts that are mentioned in the laws, you're going to go to jail. The closest laws that are enforced, because there are laws here in the United States that are not enforced. They're on the books, but they're not enforced. For example, we have laws against um, jaywalking, mm -hmm. but they don't enforce those laws. Mm -hmm. So therefore, people get away with it. And then as human beings, we think, well, I got away with this. I could get away with that. And that's a problem. We baby people too much. We need to enforce the laws we have instead of trying to make new laws. And therefore, we won't baby people. So in the United States, in the military, they have the Uniform Military Code of Justice. Those laws are in force if you're in the military. Because remember, as soon as you sign up in the military, you're government property. So therefore, you're telling them you have the every right to enforce these laws if I break them. That's what you're saying. As soon as you sign on the dotted line, that's it. It's a wrap. You don't belong to yourself. Keep that in mind. When we sign the line with Jesus, we don't belong to ourselves. So when we look in the military, they give you a book right away, you know, from Code of Justice, get to know this. Know what's right, what's wrong. Because if you are gonna be held to a higher standard. Here's the thing, in that code book, Uniform um, Military Code of Justice, it states no fornication. It states no adultery. Now, I don't know how they're gonna catch you. Somebody will have to be standing outside that window and be like, okay, I saw him with somebody's wife and I took pictures, but there's a point behind those laws. They're meant to be reinforced, to correct, to remind us we don't belong to ourselves. When you're in the military, you belong to the government, so you're held to a higher standard. Why, as Christians, we're not holding ourselves to a higher standard? We belong to the Lord. There should be higher law. There's no higher law than the Lord's law. We should be respecting that and hold ourselves accountable. 
technically, under the law, we're in the honor system. When you mess up, you're supposed to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, repentance. And remember, the key to repentance is promising you're not going to do it again. Otherwise, you're habitually sinning. That means you're in constant sin. The Lord knew that as long as we want to deserve, we are going to sin. We're not perfect. He's been in our flesh. So as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to have moments of conflict between you and the spirit. But who holds the key to the prison? Is it the flesh or the spirit? It's the spirit. Now, if you give your key to the flesh, then the flesh is going to have control. And that's the problem. We many times give our key to the flesh. We have to be mindful of that. So going down forward, we see in verse 21, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This is called to discipleship. When he says come follow me, he says you have to give up everything that identifies you as you and follow me because now you have to be like me. So here's the thing. This young man was infatuated with wealth. That's why it was difficult for him. This doesn't mean that he didn't try to be as Christ-like as possible in the sense, because remember, this is without him recognizing who Christ is. He did seem to love the Lord, but he loved his wealth more. So in that encounter he had with Jesus, he didn't recognize Jesus as Messiah because he was too infatuated with his wealth. How many people have you met like that? Doesn't mean they're wealthy, they just like the idea of money. The money becomes an idol. See, we have to be careful as human beings. We lift up idols. We're quick to lift up idols. We saw that in the Old Testament for those who were reading in the Bible with us in a year. Soon as Moses went up to the mountain and left um, Aaron and Miriam in charge, what happened? The people started rebelling. And they said, oh, Moses didn't come down from the mountain yet. Let's lift up another God. Aaron went with the flow. As leaders for Christ, we can't go with the flow. We are held accountable, so we have to hold people accountable. This is not right. You have to testify that. You have to live it. Aaron didn't live it, so he created an idol. Therefore, when Moses came down, he got upset, and the Lord got upset. This is a problem. We tend to lift up idols. Sometimes it may be our children. It may be a vehicle. It may be your career. But we lift up idols. And we need to stop with the nonsense. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need kingdom vision. We see in verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He was not ready to sacrifice. This doesn't mean as a Christian that you can't be poor. Don't get it twisted. There are wealthy Christians. Doesn't mean you can't be poor. It just means you have to be mindful not to lift up idols. Don't let your wealth become an idol. Okay? Don't let money become an idol. You can have a great job making $100,000, $200,000 a year, but don't let it become your idol. Don't be that person that's making $200,000 a year without overtime. And when the Lord says, this is the Lord's day, today is the Lord's day. And you can't be here because you want to make extra money overtime. Then you're lifting up my money as a priority over Christ. You have a misguided idea of what your priorities are. Okay, so we see here Jesus describing a missed call, a missed opportunity. Here's Jesus calling this young man to be a disciple. He says, give up your stuff and follow me. And what does he say? Oh, I can't do that. That's too much for me. I can't roll with that. And what ends up happening? He had a missed call. He had an encounter with the Lord, his Savior, and he missed the call. He missed an opportunity. It's a shame because the word doesn't say whether he comes to serve the Lord or not, but if he doesn't, then he's in damnation. How many people are in damnation missing the call? And we have to remember, that may fall on us. Remember, we're going to help be held accountable. The Lord is going to ask for a report. He's going to be like, let's say, for example, Darby, remember when I told you to minister to the person and you said you were too tired? That person ended up going into the world and that person ended up being damned. That's on you. We can't allow that to happen. All right? Now, the person refuses to serve the Lord. That's not on you. You did everything possible to bring the word of God to that person. You lived as the light in your community. 
So here we see the young man wanted to know what good thing, meaning what work he could do to demonstrate he was righteous and qualified for the kingdom. And here's Jesus re reminding them, there is no one who's good enough. No one is good enough to get into the kingdom without being covered in the blood. If you're not covered in the blood, you know you're not walking into the kingdom. Jesus is the only way. Hence the name of this church, Threshold Church of Christ. It belongs to Christ. Jesus is the only way to salvation, okay? No matter what I do, as long as I do what I'm called to do, but I still can't save you. All I could do is do the introduction. Jesus is the one that saves. So we see here Jesus is targeting the real problem. The young man was infatuated with his things. The young man believed he had yet knew something was missing in his life though. He knew something was missing. And Jesus put his finger on it. Give up everything and follow me. That's all he had to do. And he would have been wealthier. He would have been richer for it. Okay? If we go to Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And we're closing out soon. And let me know when you guys have it. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And this is focusing on Abraham and how he's justified by faith. And give me an amen when you guys have it. Amen, amen. amen, amen. So Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The key verse is going to be verse 5. But one thing I always teach you guys, read the verses before and after so you can get greater context. Because if you read just that key verse, you could get it misconstrued. Don't be misconstruing God's word. Always read before and after so you can get a better picture. So in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him as righteousness. That's the key. Notice, Abraham believed God, and it was credit to him as righteousness. Now, verse 4, now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of, to, of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. So who saves us? Jesus. Why? Because we get credited his righteousness. Picture when you were younger, you had a lousy credit score. I know I did. My credit score was like 300. I had like 20 cards and I was paying school loans and everything. And imagine, here comes someone that says, I co-signed for you because I have a 900 credit score. So when that bank sees that signature, they're not seeing your credit score. They're seeing the 900 credit score of the person who co-signed for you. This is what the blood does for us. Jesus' blood gives us his credit score. His credit score is excellent. He does not fail. We fail, but he does not fail. So when the bank come calling saying, you owe money, they don't come to you, they come to Christ. So when God the Father comes, he's gonna come to Jesus, because Jesus is our intercessor. And since we're imputed his righteousness, God the Father is gonna say, should I give him another opportunity? And Jesus steps in and says, I've been in their shoes. Give them another opportunity. So we are thankful. We should be thankful for the blood that we get another opportunity. If we look at the Old Testament as we're reading through the Bible, how many of them actually got another opportunity? They were failing left and right. They were turning away from God. They were infatuated with their things. They were infatuated with their flesh and doing fleshy things. We cannot miss the opportunity. First opportunity to serve him and to minister to those around us. We live in a community of 55,000 people. Some of us may think, oh, people can easily hide here. I see it as a captive audience. I'm gonna age myself again. Escape from New York, the movie. We're an island within an island. We have a captive audience. All we have to do is go to people. What are they gonna do, tell you no? That's what they could do. They told Jesus no. All you do is do that introduction. Hey, you want to meet my Savior, Jesus? 
We got to be better than the Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness is out there doing military operations, knocking on people's doors. And we're like, oh, I'm comfortable at home. I don't want to knock on people's doors. I don't want to do this. You know, we don't have to knock on people's doors. All we have to do is listen and wait for an opportunity. You know, we're quick to listen to our cell phone when it rains, right? But we're not quick to listen to the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is telling us, go minister to that person. You see that person sitting on that bench? They need Jesus. They need you to sit there and tell them that Jesus loves them. How many of you are answering that call? How many of you taking your responsibilities as soldiers for Christ seriously? You know, some of us, like, we, we give a lot of complaints. Oh, my back hurts, my knee hurts, my this. That shouldn't stop you from serving them. Look at Paul. How many aches and pains he went through. Yet he sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He never went without the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit didn't let him go somewhere, he says, I guess it's not meant for me to go there. It's not my business to be there. He will go here. Holy Spirit said, nope, that's not for you. Okay, I guess it's not for me. Go over here. Okay, that's where I can go. The Holy Spirit said it's good. It's a green light. This is what we have to understand. We need to pay more attention to the Holy Spirit. But in order for that to happen, you have to tune your ears to hear the voice of God. But if you're too busy watching your sports, you're too busy watching your Netflix and so on, how are you going to tune your ear to hear the voice of God? The only way you can do that is being in God's word. The only way you can do that is listening to preachings, writing notes, and verifying with the word of God. Don't take me as the word of God. Verify with the word of God. Take your notes and see, okay, let me make sure what Darby's saying is true. You verify. It's like being in the military. Yes, these orders are given. You trust that these are lawful orders, but you verify. Because here's the thing. For those who've been in the military, you know, not every person who was in charge had the sense. There were some people that got no sense. All they were doing was covering their own selves. I'm going to send this person, and then when he get in trouble, I just blame him. You know? No, you got to question. Question. There's nothing wrong with questioning. And there's nothing wrong with questioning the Lord. Just remember that he is going to give an answer and be ready for that answer. You may not like that answer, and that's okay. So, for example, that person who's praying and said, um, should I leave my spouse? And the Lord says, no, you need to stay. And you're like, what? That's what the Lord says. You trust the Lord. Now, don't be that person that, you know, you're going to put yourself in danger either. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying you look for discernment from the Lord. Don't be like John MacArthur, the pastor of the church in California, who, took, who misguidedly told a woman, um, your husband's beating you, but it's your place to stay with your husband. You can't leave your husband. That's how he counseled her. And she ended up almost dying. And thankfully, through the Holy Spirit, she decided, no, I'm not going to listen to this man. Why? Because you trust this is a godly man, but you verify with the word of God. You seek godly counsel. The title of pastor doesn't mean you know it all. It means you're a servant for Christ. That's it. Don't get sucked up in titles. Titles are meaningless. The only title that matters is serving in Christ. That's the most powerful title in the world. So when you introduce yourself, it's like I had a Bible teaching in Dunkin' Donuts a couple of, um, weeks back. And this young lady comes in and she asks us the question, oh, what are you guys doing? And we said we were doing a Bible study. And she said, oh, I'm a deacon. I don't need to know anything more. <laughs> like she knew everything just because she was a deacon. I told her, nice to meet you. I'm a servant in Christ. And Joe was like, why you didn't tell her you're a pastor? No, because the key is I'm a servant in Christ. I don't have to throw titles out. That's the main title. I'm a servant in Christ. Nice to meet you. You're a deacon. Nice to know. Amen. It's good to know. So if you're a deacon, you should be holding me accountable. You should be verified if I'm teaching the word of God, if you know so much. Right? You should be concerned about the souls. She didn't want to stay either. No, she didn't want to stay. She ran right out. She was too busy. So what, what occurred? A missed opportunity. An opportunity to grow. An opportunity to be fed. An opportunity to verify what the word of God is. Everything she knew was truly what she knew. Instead, she went on into her title. We see that in our workplace. You know, just because you're a supervisor doesn't mean you're a great supervisor. Doesn't mean that just because you're a supervisor, that was an earned title. It might have been just you, the, the boss's uh, nephew. That's all it could mean. 
So we have to keep that in mind. The most important title when you leave here is that you are serving in Christ and you better be acting in it. Serving the community, serving the Lord, being concerned for your neighbor. That's what a servant in Christ does. If you see someone who's hungry, feed them. And that doesn't mean just getting them food. It means feeding their soul. That's what we're called to do. As we minister when we do the Bible teachings in Duncan, there's people, strangers coming in. And as they're hearing God's word, they may come in with one attitude, but they're leaving with another. Because God is in the mix. When you invite God into places, he transformed the atmosphere. It has nothing to do with us. We're just being the light. We're instruments being used by the Lord. But God is the one making the change. Okay? So I hope this message blesses you. I hope it encourages you. I hope it fortifies you to not miss the call. If you have to put your phone on silence to hear the Lord, do it. But don't miss that call. You know? So here's one thing I want to leave you with. Never depend on self-reliance, depending on yourself. Think about this. Without, this is a statement. Without thinking about it, often our reasoning is this. I, by my stupidity, got into this mess. Therefore, by my stupidity, I will get out of it. That's what we think most times. I got myself into this mess. I could get myself out. You don't want to depend on anyone. You don't want to even in, bring it to the Lord because you don't want to be called out on it. Usually when we're hiding in sin, we don't want that sin revealed. Instead, we try to find other ways around it. No. We have to repent, meaning turn around. Stop sinning. Stop doing that thing that you love that the Lord doesn't. We should be doing the things that the Lord loves. I love to teach, but I couldn't love to teach without the Lord loving to teach. We see Jesus is the greatest teacher. So we have to emulate that person who's the greatest teacher. Learn from Jesus, then be like Jesus. All right? So I thank you for being with us this fine afternoon and worshiping with us this fine afternoon. We're going to lift up in prayer anyone who wants extra prayer. We had started off in prayer together as one community. But if there's anyone who wants to come up in prayer, someone who wants to continue growing in the Lord and doesn't want to miss the opportunity, just stand up and we'll pray with you. I'll send CJ to lay hands on you. CJ is going to be obedient and go pray with you. Now we're going to close out in prayer. Amen, amen, CJ. Pray for <laughs> over her. Amen, amen. So, Lord, Father God, we present Jenny before you, Lord. You notice she stood up. She wants to be that soldier for Christ that doesn't want to miss the opportunity, Lord. That you help her minister first in her home and then those around her, Lord. That you continue using her as your instrument, Lord. That you give her the strength, the knowledge, the blessing, Lord, to minister to others, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this blessed afternoon, hearing your word, Lord. Lord, thank you for allowing me to preach your word, Lord. It is such an honor to serve you, Lord, Father God, that you continue to help us all grow in your word, Lord, that we be the light in this community, Lord. We thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say, Amen, amen. amen.